Welcome to the Bringing Intimacy Back Show, where intimacy is real. On this show, we believe that intimately connecting with yourself, your significant other, children, family, friends, business networks, community, and your higher power can elevate your life to work towards a positive future. Thus, we explore intimate topics, inspiring life stories, spiritually and insightful tips on strengthening relationships. This show is hosted by Dr. April, a Florida licensed mental health counselor, relationship and intimacy therapist, board certified telemental health counselor, national certified counselor, and a certified sex therapist. She is the owner of Vacation Counseling and Cape Coral Therapists and the creator of the Intimate Connections newsletter. For more information about Dr. April's services and the Bringing Intimacy Back show, please visit bringingintimacyback.com. Check out past shows on Apple iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Now, let's get this episode of the Bringing Intimacy Back show started because we share with you the secret power to intimacy to create a life you love or love the life you create. Now, here's your host, Dr. April. Well, welcome to the Bringing Intimacy Back show. Well, today um, we've talked about a lot in dealing with intimacy, but what today what we're going to talk about is what if you're struggling and in being intimate? So the day's topic is, so you want to know why I can't be intimate. For some people, they have pain, they have dysfunction. And so what I got today is a very special young lady, a bilingual family nurse practitioner of pelvic health support. Actually, she does Pelvic Floor 101. Welcome, Kathy Gates. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Dr. April. How are you? I'm doing good. Yes, Great. yes. Yes. So Kathy's here today to talk and to educate not only you, but to also to educate me about pelvic health. And pelvic health is kind of rarely talked about um, with doctors, with couples and stuff, but it really does impact um, everyone in a relationship. So as a pelvic floor specialist, and, that's, and I, like I said, she's bilingual, she works with men, women, transgender, gender non-conforming patients experiencing chronic pelvic pain and other floor, pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, her practice is evidence-based care, and she includes medical knowledge and her biochemical approach to help us understand how we can um, be intimate or what, how we can even be with ourselves in the sense of the pelvic floor. And she does this not only because this is her passion, but she's also had experience because she's also a former cancer survivor. So yes, welcome. Thank you yes. so much. Yes, so first tell, um, tell me how you've been doing in the last few months with COVID and, and your business and all that kind of stuff. Right, so hanging in there and okay. I will say that we did shut down our offices for in-person visits for okay. March, April, and May. Our physical space is located in Boston. And so that actually opened up the possibility of virtual visits, which I never would have thought would work. I'm a pelvic floor therapist and total silver lining for me okay. that people that are ready to dive into the virtual realm. There's so many things that we can do in the virtual realm that are so beneficial to bringing balance to not only the internal muscles of the pelvic floor, but the whole person. My practice is holistic and whatever pelvic floor dysfunction is going on, we need to look at the whole person. Okay, so um, in educating um, our audience, because people may be saying, what is this pelvic floor? Absolutely, you know, I, such a good question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I would love to share that I've been a nurse practitioner for 10 years and run a women's health program and running a women's health program for four years before I knew what the pelvic floor was. So oh, okay. no shame okay. oh, in so not knowing what the pelvic floor is. Yes. I was doing, and I still do all sorts of GYN procedures mm -hmm. and never thinking, taking a step back to think about 
what's going on with the muscles, with the tissue inside. So no shame at all if no one right. knows what their pelvic floor is. Right, right. Because I don't even think gynecologists really talk about it. Not so much. No. But, yeah. yeah. No. Yes. <laughs> so your pelvic floor is in the very center of the body, the whole pelvic girdle. And we look at the pelvic girdle first. That's the center of the body. So if you think about the f- your pubic bone, and then you think about your sacrum, you have muscles inside that run from the pubic bone, like a sling all the way back to the sacrum. If you think about your hips, if you put your hands right around your hips, this, th- those, those are the sides of your pelvic girdle. And you have muscles that also run side to side. And okay. so this is a, a group of muscles that should have just enough tone to be able to keep us continent of both urine and stool. That means that, you know, it, you shouldn't leak urine when you sneeze or cough okay. or jump. Um, it should also keep us continent of stool. And mm-hmm. for women, those muscles should also allow us to keep all of the organs up and inside. So not normal to have one of the organs inside your bladder, your uterus, or even the rectum starting to pop out so that you can see them on the outside. So these muscles, this connective tissue, tendons, ligaments, nerves, they all need to work together to Mm -hmm. maintain that perfect balance for optimal health. Okay. All right. And so with, um, and I know we're talking about women with men, with men. So if you think about the internal landscape of the pelvic cavity, okay. right. And you think about the right. pubic bone, the sacrum and the hips on the sides, those are the same for everybody. Right. So basically the muscles are more or less the same. You're talking about different organs when you're talking about a male pelvic floor that would have a prostate and with a female pelvic floor, you know, you'd have the bladder, this uterus. So, but if you were to take the organs out, the muscles are and the connective the tissue are more or less the same. All the same. Okay. Okay. And so as a pelvic floor specialist, what exactly do you guys do? And then I'm also just curious how you even got into the field. Oh, totally. Great question. So what we do is we look at people sitting, standing, lying down. And we look to see front to back what it looks like. So if you think about like how much of an arch do you have in your low back? If you're somebody that has a big arch in your low back, it probably means you're tipping your pelvis forward Mm -hmm. all the time, like in maybe in sitting and standing. So if you're tipping your pelvis forward with the bones externally, what does that mean that the internal muscles are doing? most likely they're starting to work because they want to pull you back into balance between the front and the back. So we're looking a lot at that. We're also looking, if you think about your hip bones that are on the sides of your Mm -hmm. pelvis, you think of them like wheels and they Mm -hmm. rotate, they rotate forward and they rotate back. And so we're looking at, is this person walking around with one of those hips being pulled perhaps more forward or one of them pulled perhaps back and that all affects the functioning of the internal muscles also we're looking at when you're thinking about those hip bones your hip bones not only do they rotate they move up and down Mm -hmm. so you're looking does somebody just stand and sit with one of those hip bones always lifted up if Mm -hmm. that's the case that impacts the internal muscles of the pelvic floor So once we do a very thorough external examination, and this is why all of this works so well virtually, because all this stuff is so important, then if the patient is comfortable and with the patient's permission, we take a gloved lubricated finger and we gently, for women, spread the labia apart. And first Mm -hmm. look at, you need to look externally. You need to look at the vulva. You need to look at the labia. You need to see like, what is, is the tissue hydrated? Are there any areas of redness or irritation? You gently spread the labia apart, you insert a gloved lubricated finger, Mm -hmm. and then 
these are muscles like anywhere else. It's just, we don't think about them because they're inside and also because they're associated with sexual function. So right there, people just do not think about them. So then we do a very detailed exam where we're assessing. And if, if you were to put a finger inside of your own vagina, and right now I'm talking about people that were born with female anatomy. And if you were to put your index finger in and just go up a little bit, that's your bladder, right? Right. A lot of time people don't know where their bladder is. So (laughs) knowledge, knowledge is very powerful. So first thing, what we do with an internal exam is we learn the internal landscape. So if you put a finger in and you go up very superficially, like maybe to the first knuckle on Mm -hmm. your index finger, you're going to hit your bladder. If you've turned the finger around and go down, you're going to hit your tailbone, right? right? So hugely important to know where these things are. People think about their tailbone from the outside, but guess what? There's an internal component to your tailbone, right? And then, so if you've got your bladder at the top, and if you think about a clock, you can think about your bladder being at 12 Mm o'clock, right? Your tailbone being down at six o'clock. And then you just go around the whole clock and you're assessing the muscle, the tissue. Are there any areas that feel hot, hard, or tender, or just that feel very restricted? That's important information to have. So Mm -hmm. after we've done a thorough exam, then I will ask people to inhale because when we inhale, the pelvic floor muscles hopefully soften a little bit. Maybe they do, maybe they won't. I just want to know. And then I ask people to exhale and try to lift up the pelvic floor muscles or engage. I really don't like to use the word squeeze. Um, I prefer engage. And I want to see what is the, the strength of your pelvic floor? Do you have the ability to let the muscles relax? And do you have the ability to let the muscles contract? And then with all of that information, we devise the appropriate treatment plan for that patient. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yes. Yes. (laughs) As a, um, a nurse who I think most people, when they think about nursing, they think about maybe going into the hospital and helping people and all that. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What makes you specialize in this here? So Again, having run a women's health program for four years, um, I, at four years into my career, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And after a lot of chemotherapy, a lot of surgery, and I'm you know, so fortunate that the cancer is gone. Um, but after that whole process, And because I was positive for one of the breast cancer genes, I had, there's a higher risk that I would then have develop ovarian cancer. So I decided to have my ovaries taken out. So that put me into surgical menopause. So all of a sudden, like after probably, I don't know, a year and a half of treatment, then I was in surgical menopause and I was like, oh my God, it's so, it hurts to have sex. Mm. And I don't know how to help. I don't know how to help myself. Me who runs a women's health program. I don't know what to do. Okay. So I right. went to my own nurse practitioner who works at a gynecological oncology, oncology office, which is just a fancy word for a women's cancer, women's health cancer practice. Mm-hmm. And she did an exam And she said, oh my goodness, you need to go to pelvic floor therapy. And I said, what is that? (laughs) So she gave me a list of people and she said, I think you should go to these particular people. And I did, and I learned so much and it was so incredibly helpful to my own healing journey, you know, recovering from cancer. It gave me my sexual health back. And I thought, oh my God, like, how can I learn how to do this? I need to, people need to know you. I'm a nurse practitioner and I didn't know people need to know. Right. And then 
when I first tried to find a provider to help me before I went to my nurse practitioner, there's a very prominent cancer hospital in Boston. And I called them and they said that they have a survivorship program. I said, great, do you have a gynecologist? And they said, yes, yeah, she does one session for four hours once a month and there's a six month wait list to see her. Oh my gosh. And wow. right. So I just started to think about how hard it is, right? These are hard things to talk about. Like, I get it. Like nobody want, really wants to call a pelvic floor therapist. Nobody, it's hard, right? And I know right. because I didn't want to do it. Right. And then I had to put all of these different pieces together in order to learn and in order to help myself. And I thought I can be the perfect accompaniment for someone trying to like, let me help to put the pieces together to just make it easier for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're yeah. going to take a short break. When we come back, anyone who's out there listening and you're thinking, wow, I'm having trouble with intimacy. Maybe I'm in pain, maybe certain positions, maybe just, I'm just feeling uncomfortable or even like she said, even um, not even being able to um, hold your bladder all the time. You know, and that inter in interferes and, and affects intimacy. Well, she, when we come back, she's going to let us know everything that, some of the stuff that she learned, okay? Because <laughs> you don't know, we don't know everything. We've got to go see her. But also some resources and what we can do um, and what you can do to help yourself if you're experiencing troubling times and intimacy with pelvic pain. We'll be back in a few minutes. During this difficult time that we are all facing, Many people are in need of someone to talk to. One option is speaking to a therapist to express your anxieties if you're feeling isolated or just need someone that will listen and help you with coping skills to get through. Dr. April Brown is now accepting new clients and is working with her existing clients through distance video counseling. The services are through a secure online HIPAA web-based practice management platform called Simple Practice. This technology can provide a secure two-way interactive video counseling session over the internet. For more information about video counseling, please email Dr. April Brown at info at draprilbrown.com or you may call 239-565-6900. Thank you. And remember, we are all in this together. Welcome back to the Bringing Intimacy Show, where intimacy is real. Today, we're talking about pelvic floor and pelvic pain. So, um, Kathy, I'm going to have our specialist here, Kathy Cates, a uh, family nurse practitioner. So, Kathy, if there's a woman out there, um, we'll start just with the female at the moment. And they're like, you know, I'm having pain. You know, every time we have in intercourse, for some reason, I'm having pain. Yeah. What would you suggest in the sense of um, this pelvic floor and maybe getting some help or resources? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So first question, um, is there any foreplay happening before like, are we talking about, I guess I would first say what kind, I need to be clear on the pain. Is it pain with foreplay? Is it pain with penetration of penis, sex toy, anything like that? So just getting clear on what it is and then clear Why on what is- Why is it important to have the foreplay? Pardon me? Why is it important to have the foreplay? So you can think about foreplay like the warm up. You wouldn't go and run, you wouldn't go and run five miles without stretching before you went for your run. And okay. so people don't think about, especially women, don't mm -hmm. think about that, oh, I need to warm up those muscles to get ready to then be able to put something inside. Mm -hmm. With foreplay, with oral stimulation or stimulation with a finger or fingers or even a vibrate or anything like that, 
When you stimulate the tissue, you're increasing the blood flow. That's going to help to open everything up. It's going to increase the amount of oxygen in the circulation. That is all very good preparation for having something then enter inside of the vagina. And foreplay is important with or without an orgasm Mm -hmm. because you're still getting so much of that benefit from getting that tissue ready. Okay. Okay. And I'm also, what you're also saying, it's that moisture has to be there. Totally. Which leads me to my next question for the person. Once we identify when the pain is happening, are you using lubrication and what are you using? And are you putting enough lubrication? Okay. If we're talking in terms of heteronormative intercourse right now, like, are you literally putting enough lubrication on his penis and you'd be surprised at the number of people, women who don't put lubrication inside of them. Right, and some people would say, um, something must be wrong with me if I have to put lubrication. Totally, I hear that all the time. And so I feel like one of the most important things I can do is say there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. Nothing at all. Some people produce more than others. Even people that do produce a lot of lubrication, I still find oftentimes, will benefit from lubrication. And then you have to be very careful about exactly what lubrication you're going to use. There's a lot of just bad, (laughs) bad ingredients out there for people. So you want to look for as few as ingredients as possible. You don't want anything warming, cooling, no smell, no glycerins, no parabens. Always, you know, you can try a water-based lubricant first. Okay. You could consider silicone, right? Okay. A silicone-based lubricant right. or even an olive oil-based or an oil-based lubricant. Okay. So why um, no smells and all this other stuff? Um, all these you, ingredients, you know, that people think, well, that may make things better. Or... Right. Because you don't want to irritate the vaginal pH, right? Like your vagina is this miraculous self-cleaning oven. The balance, the pH of your vagina is just right. And literally, (laughs) it really is like a self-cleaning oven. Yeah, that's not kind of what the media show. show Absolutely not, absolutely not. not. Like Like, nobody should douche. No, they need to all be just thrown out, burned. Like there is nothing wrong. Your vagina just as it is is like I said, it's a miraculous self-cleaning oven. So we don't want to introduce anything with a lubricant that could be potentially disruptive to that. Mm -hmm. To that system. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's good to know because I think most people think that, um, and I think especially in the, I don't know, seventies and eighties, maybe even the nineties, douching was very popular. Oh, totally. Oh, I, all, it, it's still, you'd be surprised, yes. right? You'd be surprised at the number of people. And again, like you said, April, it's this idea that, you know, the vagina is dirty and it needs to be cleaned. And that mm-hmm. is not true. It is, like I said, miraculous self-cleaning oven. <laughs> yes. yes, which is a great thing to do and a great thing to um, even teach your young ladies in your your kids and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So once you have the lubricant, what else should happen in the sense of, I know you said um, foreplay is really important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also you want to ask people about positioning, right? Okay. And sometimes there are changes that can be made to the positioning that might help you know, maybe propping up glutes on a pillow sometimes can be helpful. Sideline can be helpful, just experimenting with different positions. And these are all things that I would want someone to try who, you know, came and said, I'm having pain with intercourse. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I've even heard that some people say, and I even know from the research that they feel like something is wrong with them if they can't have an orgasm with their husband the traditional manner. Oh, totally. And I believe the research is something like 
I think 75 or 80% of women do not have an orgasm with penetrative intercourse. Right. 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 And which is, you said, yeah. And like you said, with the, um, trying different positions because all our vaginas do not look the same. No, Yeah. no. So these are all things that you can think about. And this is for somebody who is having sex and it's, hurting. This is not for somebody who, you know, has never been able to put a tampon in, can't put anything inside and is, has not had sex. That's a very different discussion. But the, these are all things I would think about prior to maybe coming to see someone. Like if you're waiting, you know, that if you're on a wait list to see someone like me, maybe these are things you could try. I also think you have to And this is hard and this is really hard right now during COVID, you have to think about creating your state of mind, right? Like you have to be present with yourself and also with the person that you're with, right? Because when your mind, and you, I'm sure could speak to this Mm -hmm. very thoughtfully, when your mind is racing and racing and racing, it's very hard to slow that down sometimes to be present in your own body and then to feel what it feels like to be connected to someone. Mm -hmm. And that those are all hard when you're under stress and when you're under stress and your mind is racing, the reaction, the physical reaction in the body can often be to tighten. And it's not just in your back and your shoulders. Guess what? It's your pelvic floor too. Right. Right. And look, just like you said, if you're stressed or if you're not present, um, and something is happening to your body, your body's going to tense up and it's yes. not going to be relaxed and it may not even produce the fluids Correct. that it needs to because it's all tense. Correct. Yes. Yes. I know you mentioned earlier um, vibrators and some people are like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Does that help? Does that not help? Totally. So it depends on the patient and their comfort level with okay you know, first of all, is someone comfortable using a vibrator and then also exploring a little bit if they're not kind of teasing that out a little bit. And why is that? Right. Right. Um, So vibrators can be great. I think, again, there are a lot of vibrators out there that are made from less than ideal material. Like you want, you need to treat yourself, right? Like you need a nice medical grade, silicone, soft, nice, beautifully manufactured (laughs) Okay. dilator, a vibrator, you are worth it. Right. Right. And then you have to figure out, is someone going to be more comfortable with just clitoral stimulation, external stimulation? Is there a way that I have a lot of patients that have vibrators that they're only using outside. So sometimes we think about, oh, is there a way that we could maybe think about using that inside? And again, the whole idea behind the vibrator is the stimulation of the tissue. The tissue gets stimulated it gets a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more open. Okay. So even, um, I know we really haven't talked about it, but um, some people have pain and they said, well, I didn't have pain with this partner, but now I have pain with this partner. Maybe the size is different. Sure. Um, so dilators, can, and can that really help in the sense of if you're starting to have pain to just to see yeah. where? Uh-huh. Absolutely. So what we do, and again, these are for patients that are already sexually active with a partner. Um, If it's someone who hasn't ever been sexually active, it's going to be a little bit different. But what we do is we bring out the whole set of vaginal dilators. They're sized one through eight. We take a look, we open the, we open them up, we look together, and then we have the the woman in my office, we say, how big is your partner? And then like when he is fully erect and then we find that dilator and that is our goal, but that is by no means what we start with. Okay. So you do start. Okay. Totally. And again, smaller, smaller, exactly. Because what is a dilator doing? It's stretching. Mm -hmm. It's stretching. Right. And so often people just think about dilation as like what happens to the cervix when you have a baby, right? right? That's like the common thing that people, when people talk about dilation, 
but vaginal dilators are fantastic for stretching the muscle and the tissue, right? And so if you're consistent with a dilator routine, if that's something that's appropriate for you, you will absolutely see results. Okay. Are there also um, exercises to help stretch? Yes. So anytime that you or we can find a physical shape that puts your body in, into that shape that will allow your pelvic floor muscles to relax, then yes. And that's, a, you know, so think about like if you lie down flat on the floor with your knees bent and your feet okay. are hip width distance apart, your sacrum, the whole back of your pelvic girdle is supported. Your shoulder blades are on the ground. They're supported. Your pelvic girdle and your shoulder girdle, they're girdles, they're stabilizers for you. Now, if you just open out your feet a little bit wider than hip width distance apart, put the knees together, voila, your pelvic floor starts to soften. Mm, okay. And I will say the hallmark of pelvic floor therapy is diaphragmatic breathing. Okay. And can you explain what that is? I absolutely can. So if you were to put your hands like right where your ribs come together in the front of the chest, right? And there's a little divot where they write, where, right where they come together, right in that whole soft area, that's your diaphragm. That's your muscle for breathing. Okay. That works in concert with your pelvic floor. So every time you inhale, that pelvic floor can soften a little bit. Every time you inhale, the pelvic floor can engage. And I think what we're seeing just manifested hugely right now with all of the stress is no one can take a break. No one can breathe. Everyone's breathing with their, with their, from their um, upper chest and from their neck and with their shoulders. So then you've essentially shut down the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And when your diaphragm is shut down, that shuts down your pelvic floor. So if you're walking around with a tight pelvic floor, it's never gonna let go because you're not taking a breath the way that we are designed to take a breath. And so I know we've talked a, a lot about the female body. Yeah. Um, how does this impact on the male? Excellent question. So when there is pelvic floor dysfunction for men, we see scrotal pain, testicular pain, premature ejaculation, difficulty getting an erection, maintaining an erection, a lot of urinary symptoms like urinary frequency, urinary burning, and there's never an infection. They get like urinalysis after urinalysis and never an infection. And they go to the urologist and nine times out of 10, they're like, you have, you know, you need antibiotics. And then right. there's never any change. And then yes. hopefully they find out about pelvic floor therapy and then they begin to learn. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Are there anything that causes um, pelvic floor dysfunctions that I don't know, that we do or that we don't eat or any, oh, it's sure. just. So posture has a ton to do with it, mm. right? And so I that's number one right there. When you sit and when you stand, you know, are you, that is the hugely important for keeping that pelvic girdle in balance. And I think you asked about eating. Yes. Right. So also an excellent question. And like anything else, I believe we have to think about food as medicine. If I, you know, I write prescriptions all the time for people. I wish I could write a prescription for a healthy food. That, that would probably be the prescription I would write the most. So anything, you know, if you're eating a diet, that's got a lot of processed food, a lot of sugar, anything that's going to trigger that inflammation cascade and increase the inflammatory response in the body. Absolutely. That will affect your pelvic floor muscles. It affects everywhere else. So it, you're, it's going to affect those muscles. They just happen to be inside. Right. Yeah. Right. Do you have patients that's that first are embarrassed to come totally. and then second have not even told their partner that they're in pain? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. All the time. 
all the time. And I feel it's so important to help particularly women to be Mm -hmm. able to advocate for themselves to say, this is what makes me feel good. Right. Right. And so part of this whole part of also, I feel like a part of pelvic floor therapy is also really helping women to reclaim their sexuality and what makes them feel good and what doesn't make them feel good. And that we're all a work in process. Okay. All right. We just got a question um, with um, a person out there listening is that she had pain with sex and she found out that she had fibroids Mm. after ending up with having a hysterectomy and she had um, sex with all different and wonderful for her, but because there was no pain. She wasn't actually able to have an orgasm. Mm -hmm. Um, And she's happy for not being in pain, but she cannot have the orgasm. With? With having sex. Yeah, with intercourse, yes. Yeah, okay. So again, I would say, and what is the question? The question is basically, I guess she had a hysterectomy and she had, because she had fibroids. Fibroids, sure. Yes, and so... Um, that took away the pain, but she isn't still yet able to have an orgasm. Right. So what I would say we should think about is the use of a vibrator and maybe, you know, after an exam, like maybe the use of dilators to really assess the tone of the pelvic floor. And she may not be having pain with sex anymore, which is wonderful, but I do wonder, and I, if there's some underlying what we call hypertonicity or tension in the pelvic floor that is getting in the way of being able to have an orgasm. Okay, so when you talked about um, the examination Mm -hmm. and you um, you say it's like a clock. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So if you find this little area of the clock, I know around eight o'clock or somewhere, that's very tender. Mm Mm-hmm. What do you guys do with that? So what we do, yeah, no, it's a great question. So what we do, we use a really a technique that's called myofascial release, myo muscle fascia connective tissue. So what we do is we identify the restriction and then we go in with very gentle pressure. And it's really a symbiotic relationship because we are gently going in and if you will, re-educating that tissue like you don't have to be that tight. And so there has to be where the symbiosis happens is that the person on the table has to be able to let us in a little bit. And through extended gentle pressure, we are able to sink in through level layers of tissue, connective tissue, fascia, deep into the muscle. And you just have to wait. You have to listen with your hands very deeply and you have to wait and it's through that gentle sustained pressure and time that you can often maybe not right away maybe not the first few times few sessions you can get that restriction to release okay so it's kind of like you saying like um for simple terms if you have a bruise yeah yeah a muscle bruise what you guys do is, is gently, gently massage it. Right. It's like if you have, you know, you can't roll your internal muscles with a foam roller, right? But if you're like rolling out, maybe that's a better example. Like people have um, those muscles that run down the sides of the thigh, right? Those get super tight. So that's an area that people will often foam roll. Right. And then as you're rolling back and forth, you identify a spot that's like really tight and you wait, right? Like you kind of wait, you let the weight of your body sink in to use to let that tension dissipate. And that's what we do with the myofascial release work is we let through gentle, very gentle, but yet targeted work. We allow for the muscle and the tissue to release. Can you do that? Um, so I know you say you have online services. Yes. So excellent question. And what I was going to say is that we can teach patients to create that similar sensation by using a pelvic wand. 
Okay, and pelvic wine is something that is um, prescribed or it's something you can so buy off Amazon? You, can, you could totally buy it off of Amazon. I would say I wouldn't recommend buying it off of Amazon <laughs> because again, just yep. like the lubricants and also just like the dilators, there's a lot of stuff out there that is not good. And if you're going to do pelvic floor therapy, you're going to get a vibrator, maybe get a dilator, maybe get a wand. You deserve the best one you could find. And we have vetted them for you. So oh, you don't awesome. have to worry about it. If you go on my website, I put the vibrators, the dilators and the wands that you should be looking at. You don't go down the rabbit hole. It's, it's not going to do you any good. So then in this virtual space, I talk people through how they're going to use the wand, how they can identify those tender spots and mm -hmm. then what they're going to do to release it. Okay. Well, I think it's the perfect spot for us to take a short commercial and for you to let us know all the services you provide and even the, yeah, the resources and all that kind of stuff. So take it away, Kathy. Great. Okay. So this is Kathy Cates. You can find me at pelvichealthsupport.com, 617, uh, oh, I need no, 651-1436. I never call myself. Um, and we offer all whole body myofascial release care using a biomechanical approach as well with a focus on the pelvic floor for men, women, transgender patients, and non-conforming patients. When you visit the website, you'll find evidence-based resources from my wonderful colleagues where my physical office space at Wellist Integrative Health is located. You'll find evidence-based articles to read for resources, don't go down the rabbit hole. You'll find links for the best vaginal and rectal dilators we've been able to find, the best pelvic wands we've been able to find, and examples of a water-based lubricant, oil-based and silicone-based. And you'll also be able to see the full offering of services that we offer, not only in office, but virtually as well. All right, thank you so much. And you can definitely find her on um, Instagram oh, and Pelvic right. Floor in Pete, yes. Yes, I yes. forgot about um, that. And on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn, on LinkedIn. too, yeah. <laughs> Founder. Yes, that's definitely. Thank you, Dr. Um, April. That's okay. That's okay. Before we go into our tip section, um, I was just thinking, so we haven't, we've talked mostly about um, male and female relationships, but also you, I'm assuming you also work with a variety of other relationships, but also with transgenders who are transforming into um, another aspect or their, yes. you know, yes, yes. And helping them adjust to their new body parts and stuff. You also exactly. do that Absolutely. kind of thing. Oh, okay. Absolutely, right. Okay. And that's, and that's also where the um, dilator, vaginal dilators can be really, really helpful for people. Okay. okay. Especially people oh. that maybe weren't born with a vagina, but now they have one. Right. Yeah. Right. Awesome, yes. Yeah. So um, in that next session right here, which we've kind of been talking about some tips, yeah. but what are some tips for, well, number one, let's start with the partners. So mm -hmm. what are some tips for partners who may know that their wife or girlfriend or lover is experiencing pain? Talk about it, be open about it and create a space where you don't have to feel shame around it. Advocate for yourself and a lot of listening on both sides, number one. What are the tips for the people who are experiencing the difficulties? To name it and then to figure out where you can go to get help. And once we name it, and also once you realize that you can get help, it starts to become, you normalize it, right? We have to normalize this for people. A lot of people suffer with it might not be a lot of pain, right? A lot of people will say, oh, it doesn't hurt that much, but it always hurts a little bit when he goes in. Well, you know what? I'm ready to say no, like that we don't, it doesn't have to be like that. So naming it, 
being honest about it, knowing where to find your resources so that we can normalize it for people. And it becomes something that's part of the conversation and not just the only time that people talk about their pelvic floor is postpartum. That's it. Right. And I'm so happy you just said, number one is to name it because some people think, um, gosh, this pain will go away. Right. And that there's something wrong with me. And I'm here to say there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. What I always say to people is let's talk about all the good things that your pelvic floor has done for you up until, I don't know, my 35 year old patient, right? Like for 34 years, like, wow, your continent, all your organs are up where they're supposed to be. You had a baby, like, wow, like let's celebrate all the good that your pelvic floor has done when you didn't even think about it. Mm-hmm. right? Like that's the thing you never thought about it. You don't start thinking about it until there's a symptom, like perhaps maybe now you have pain, right? right? So let's, let's reframe it and look at what your pelvic floor has done for you when you didn't know anything about it. So imagine what your pelvic floor can do if you actually start to learn about it. Right. Do you also help? Cause I'm just thinking that I've heard where um, a partner, I said to his his, his wife or whatever, that um, after the baby, her vagina feels different. Totally. And the you know main I mean? reason, right. But yeah. the main reason the vagina feels different is if someone is breastfeeding, their estrogen levels plummet and we need estrogen to buff up the walls of the vagina and make it plump and juicy. And without that, mm-hmm. it's almost like the vagina looks like a woman who's in menopause. Mm. So I spend a lot of time, and again, you'll find this on my website as well, postpartum moisturizing. It's different than lubricating for intercourse. It's a totally different thing. And women need to be thinking about this from the get-go. Like as soon as that baby comes out, like I tell people, get all the, order what you need. Right. (laughs) Have it in your overnight bag, because that's probably more important than whatever else you have in your overnight bag is your Volvo vaginal moisturizing routine postpartum. Oh, you, you, so your suggestion is to, as soon as that baby um, comes out and you're back home. Yeah. To and stop. once, you know, like once the bleeding has stopped, bleeding. assuming that there's no infection or, you know, right. any of that stuff, once you're medically right. cleared, you right. have to start. It's like, you know, you're in Florida, I'm in Boston, the Boston winters are so cold. And if you don't put your facial moisturizer on in the winter, your whole skin is dry and cracked and it hurts, right? People don't think about their vulva and their vagina in that way. But I can tell you that what, especially postpartum, especially menopause, once you start moisturizing your vulva and your vagina, it is life-changing. Mm-hmm. Yes. How often, um, since we're talking about this, should people moisturize their vagina? Totally. So I love that for people to moisturize the vulva, if that's appropriate, every day, like after you get out of the shower, moisturize. And then internal, it depends on what you're using. Um, If you're going to use a vaginal estrogen, it depends maybe once or twice a week, but again, it depends on the particular patient, but there are a lot of things that we can use that aren't estrogen. Um, so for example, there's a really nice hyaluronic acid based okay. vaginal suppository. Many people will know hyaluronic acid because it's what's in face serums. It's what's in right. face creams. It's a plumper upper of the skin of the face. It can do the same thing for the vagina. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you know, we'll start with maybe three times a week and we see how it goes. We also use vitamin E suppositories Mm -hmm. for vaginal moisture, like super hydrating vitamin E, you know, and you just, it's kind of trial and error and you have to see what works for that particular patient. Right. So what you're also saying, which we have, we just mentioned a little bit, was like for people in menopause, there's also a lot of natural things you can do. Totally versus taking, um, I don't know, a lot of hormones or. Right. right. I mean, and I will say about estrogen, a lot of people are, you know, because I am a nurse practitioner, because I prescribe, because I work very closely with a lot of oncologists and gynecologists, a lot of people are afraid of estrogen. 
And I don't think you need to be, I think you need to have that conversation with your provider. Okay. Because it's a tiny amount. It gets absorbed systemically. And I think a lot of us in the medical world are like, Ooh, estrogen bad. And I think we shouldn't discount its use. And I think there are many other things to try before, like the vitamin E, like the hyaluronic acid, all those kinds of things. It's not a, but it's an, and. Okay. Good. Yes. Yeah. We've covered the whole um, realm in the sense of dealing with um, this pelvic floor and how important it is. And just think like when you drink a lot of water and you're eating well, your tissue, your muscles are well hydrated, you move better. It's the same thing, right? With the internal muscles. If mm -hmm. you're moisturizing appropriately, eating a healthy diet, those internal muscles are gonna function better too. Right, so as you just said again, the healthy diet really does help. Huge, huge. With, with intimacy and, and that kind of stuff. And it's one of the things you've also mentioned earlier was it's really important for um, as females to explore our body. Absolutely. And we have to figure out what makes us feel good. And then right. we, once we figure that out, we need to advocate for ourselves with our partner to say, mm -hmm. this is what makes me feel good. Can right. you help me with this? I'm connected to you. Can you help me to make me feel good? Right. I have had listeners or people that I know that have been um, afraid to even look at their own body. Yes. You know, the, that's why uh, we have mirrors in the office. And even yes. for virtual visits, uh, when I send the Zoom invitation, I say, please have a mirror. Okay. All right, because it's important to know your body, to see it. 100%. Right. And right. it's beautiful. Whatever, whatever body you have, it is beautiful because it's yours. Right, exactly. And when you know more about it, that helps your partner understand. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So you do um, online visits and visits mm -hmm. in person? Okay. Correct. Okay. And you see people outside of um, Boston? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good, yes. good, good, yeah. good. And, and because then, I'm bilingual, I also have a few people that I see um, in Spanish speaking countries around. Oh, the world. awesome. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do, is it the same sometimes cultural? thing where women are just sometimes afraid to talk about their yes okay in my experience taking care of a lot of latina women it, it's just forget it like it's very taboo but that that's right. in my particular experience and i don't mean to make a generalization just in my own 10 years of caring for latina women right. most you know when you say people have no idea what makes them feel good they've never been asked it's exactly. never been part of the conversation. So part right. of my life's work is to help. I think, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And as I was just thinking, um, this is something that maybe as moms that we should even be talking to our daughters about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like, what does it mean to advocate for yourself and ask for what makes you feel good? There are two people in a relationship. Right. It's not just about pleasing someone else. It's about this creating this intimate intimacy together in which you are both feeling good. Mm -hmm, definitely. So on your website, do you also have a good book for people who may be wanting to understand more about this pelvic health? Yes, absolutely. There are two that I love. Um, Emily Nagoski, Come yes, As You I, Are. I'm sure yes, that that's on it. your bookshelf. Yeah. April. Yes, it is. Um, I think that's a wonderful one. And I also really like her book about burnout. Okay. She, she co-wrote it with her twin sister. Right. I just came across that and thought it was helpful. And I love, and you may have this on your shelf as well, um, Better Sex Through Mindfulness by Lori yes. Botto. Yes. Yeah. Those okay. are my go-tos. Good. Good. Well, Kathy, Kate, thank you so much for being on the show. Everybody who's listening, if you want to get to know her and connect with her. Her phone number is 617-651-1436. Definitely check out her website. It's pelvichealthsupport.com. Um, you can check on it for visits to her. Also check on it for resources. You can email her at kathy at pelvichealthsupport.com. She's on Instagram, um, pelvicfloornp, and of course, in 
on LinkedIn and Kathy Cates Pelvic Health. Thank you so much again for being on the show. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. April. I so appreciate it. Yes. This has been the Bringing Intimacy Back show. Thank you guys for being, for listening. Check us out on Back or follow us on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, or Spotify. Thank you.